A 30-year marriage between high school sweethearts. We were very bonded and whole and loved our family. Torn apart by a husband's affair. I don't think Linda saw a life without Jack. I think they had been together so long that this was her life. To some, she seemed angry enough to kill. I had a gut feeling that somehow Linda was behind something. To others, she was a victim, caught up in a horrible crime. She worshipped the ground my dad walked on. In 1995, a Florida couple named Jack and Linda Jones seemed to have a perfect life. A long marriage, a dream home, two beautiful daughters. Then Jack Jones had an affair with an 18-year-old woman that left his wife devastated and his marriage in tatters. Four months later, Jack Jones was murdered. Linda Jones was convicted of masterminding the killing, driven, the state said, by a thirst for vengeance. In a rare interview with American Justice, Linda Jones adamantly denies any involvement in the crime and claims that she was unfairly targeted by overzealous investigators. My conviction is first degree murder and I have a natural life sentence with no parole. Since 1997, Linda Jones has been serving time for the murder of her husband, Jack Jones. The first year I couldn't even read, I couldn't focus. You cry a lot, even if you get on medication to try to help with the depression. Linda's life behind bars is a stark contrast to the happier days she once had. In 1964, Linda was a high school junior with a bright future. On her way to class one day with her close friend Janice Cole, a young man caught Linda's eye. I remember distinctly, we were walking out to PE class and we both stopped and I said, oh my gosh, who's this new guy? She looked at him and they kind of clicked and she says, that's the man I'm gonna marry. And sure enough, they did get married. Linda and Jack Jones were together for 30 years until he was murdered. To this day, Linda Jones maintains that the lead investigator set her up and that she was wrongfully convicted in her husband's death. It never occurred to me that I would be convicted on hearsay. It never occurred to me that people can get up there and other people would believe it with no proof. None. But for the investigator who spent over a year collecting evidence in the case, Linda's guilt is not in question. There's no doubt in my mind that she hired it and had it done. She's right where she belongs to be right now. Okay, what's the problem? It all began on the night of November 7th, 1995, near Jacksonville, Florida. A full moon hung over the small waterfront community of Lake Asbury. At 8.31 p.m., a desperate call went up to 911. The caller was Linda Jones. She was transferred to a public safety officer. Can you tell me what happened? <laughs> man, 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 man. Okay, they still there now? No! I, I can't get this place apart. Police and emergency teams raced to the home. There, on the floor of the family room, they found 48-year-old Jack Jones bound with tape, lying in a pool of blood. He had been severely beaten and was pronounced dead at the scene. Detective Tom Waugh 
of the Clay County Sheriff's Department was one of the first to arrive at the house. We were able to observe blood spatter. It started in a foyer, went around into a den, and that's where the final rest of the murder took place there. It was a violent, violent homicide. Seemingly overcome by grief and with slight injuries herself, Jack Jones' 48-year-old wife, Linda, was taken to the hospital. I think that was the only time I've ever screamed and collapsed. And I really didn't believe it. In the ambulance ride, I kept thinking, no, this is wrong, this is wrong. It can't be true. At the hospital, police questioned Linda about the night's events. She said that she and her husband had been watching television when she heard a noise at the front door. We both turned around and looked, and there was three men standing there. According to Linda, the men wore masks. She said they walked to her husband, grabbed him, and began beating him with a baseball bat. Linda said the men then covered her mouth and bound her hands with duct tape. I was dragged up by the hair of the head. I was taped. We were separated in two different rooms. I couldn't hear or see what was going on. Right before they left, they came and drugged me and threw me on him. I remember one of them picked up a gun and said, I ought to shoot you. Didn't fire the gun. And then they left. After a couple of minutes, Linda said she wrestled free of the duct tape, called 911, and then tried to revive Jack. Back at the Jones house, crime scene technicians were collecting evidence, while Detective Waugh tried to piece together exactly what happened. Waugh noticed that there was no forced entry into the home, and that the intruders took only a few valuables. There was jewelry and all kinds of items of value laying right there on the floor. So right off the bat, how can robbery or how can theft or anything else be a motive in this case? Because they left fruits of the crime. Later that night, authorities canvassed the area. A neighbor told police that he had seen a 1994 or 95 maroon Nissan minivan speed away from the Jones house just before 8.30 p.m. That was around the time of the 911 call. Detective Waugh, it turned out, was familiar with the Jones household. In the weeks before Jack Jones' murder, Linda had called police to the home several times. On two occasions, she claimed the house had been burglarized and that she had been attacked. While investigating those incidents, the detective learned that Linda had recently found out about an affair between her husband and an 18-year-old high school student named Kerry Davis. The one or two times I talked to Linda, you could tell that she was angry inside, very angry inside. At the time, Wa says, Linda claimed she suspected Kerry Davis had masterminded the alleged crimes. On the night of the murder, Wa sent officers to bring the young woman to the police station for questioning. Kerry told authorities that Jack Jones had been at her home that evening. She said Jack told her that Linda had called him earlier in the day and threatened that if he wasn't home by 7 p.m., she would kill herself. My thoughts with that information was that Linda had a reason for wanting Jack to be home that night. And I don't know if this was planned. It was planned. The day after the murder, an autopsy revealed that Jack Jones had died after being beaten with a cylindrical object. Police officers and crime scene specialists swept the neighborhood looking for the murder weapon and any other evidence that might lead to a suspect. Detective Waugh ran a computer search of all 1995 Nissan minivans registered in Clay and Duval counties van similar to the one the neighbors saw outside the Jones home. A name come up that I could cross from the vans to a business involved with Linda Jones. 
and that name was Donald Bradley. Donald Bradley, the detective learned, owned a 1995 maroon Nissan. He was also a client of Linda's accounting firm. To Waugh, it was more than a coincidence. The detective subpoenaed Bradley's cell phone records from the night of the killing. Then, a few days later, the crime lab made another important discovery, a fingerprint on the inside layer of a piece of duct tape used to tie up Linda Jones. It was on the tape in such a manner it can only be there, placed by the individual that had been there that night. That was a biggie, because fingerprints are like photographs. <laughs> they tell a story. Investigators now had two critical pieces of information, a name and a fingerprint. But police wouldn't be able to put together a case until they took a hard look at Linda Jones and her 30-year marriage that fell to pieces. November 1995. Police in the small waterfront community of Lake Asbury, Florida, were looking into the murder of 48-year-old Jack Jones. His wife, Linda, claimed the two had been attacked in their home by intruders. Police had some promising leads. A fingerprint was found on a piece of duct tape used to restrain Linda. Also, one of her accounting clients, a man named Donald Bradley, owned a maroon minivan like the one seen leaving the Jones house the night of the murder. On November 20th, Detective Tom Waugh got hold of Bradley's cell phone records. They showed that on the night of the crime, Donald Bradley called Linda Jones three times. The last phone call was 8.17, and 13 minutes later, she's calling 911. It was ironic that this phone call was just prior to the 911 call. Bradley's fingerprints were already on record for a past domestic battery offense. Detective Waugh submitted the prints to the crime lab. They did not match the one found on the duct tape. Still, Detective Waugh believed that Bradley's van and his phone calls to Linda Jones showed that the two were somehow involved in the murder. Hoping to find proof, Detective Waugh began looking into the 30-year marriage between Jack and Linda Jones. He discovered a once picture book relationship torn apart by infidelity, jealousy, and anger. Linda Darlene Taylor was born in 1947 into a middle-class family in the Riverview area of Jacksonville, Florida. Linda's childhood was filled with weekend cookouts and close family ties. Every holiday was a get together, a barbecue, a fish fry, uh, because there would probably be 50 to 60 people at one time. When she was seven years old, Linda met Janice Cole. They became fast friends. We just hit it off. She was a very pretty, uh, smart, blonde, popular, the kind of person that I would like to have been at that age. The friends were both juniors in high school when Linda first met a senior named Jack Jones. The two were soon inseparable. Even my mother, the first day he brought me home from school, she was looking out the window and she said, so this is the guy you're gonna marry. I had not even mentioned his name. The couple got married in 1965, a year and a half after they met. Both were still teenagers. You kind of look at a couple and you think, oh, that's the couple that's going to be together for a while. The Joneses bought a house just a block from where Linda grew up. Jack began working at a car dealership and Linda at an accounting firm. In 1972, Linda and Jack had their first daughter, Shane. Another daughter, Jill, came along three years later. My sister and I were both daddy's girls. He would do anything. He would be there. I could call him anytime, ask him to do anything, get me anything. I mean, we were downright rotten. In 1984, Linda and Jack found an acre of land on Lake Asbury. 
30 miles from Jacksonville. He said, this is it. He said, this is where we're going to live. Jack decided to build the house himself. For the next two years, he worked on his dream home brick by brick. Once the family settled in, life seemed perfect. Jack had been promoted to manager at his car dealership. Linda became an associate at an accounting firm. We had a strong marriage. I'm not going to say that we never had differences. Of course we did. But our basic ultimate goals was the same. Our children, each other, to go forward, planning our future, planning the golden years. But in the early 1990s, after 25 years of marriage, Linda's friend Jenna says she began to notice cracks in the relationship. As time progressed, I really feel like Jack might not have been happy. He was very quiet. He was one of those you had to actually bring out, you know, where Linda liked to go out and do things and be with people. No one thought it was enough to ruin the marriage. Everybody has problems. I mean, I was married for 17 years, and you just go on with your life and hopefully overcome these problems in your marriage. But it didn't happen that way. At the end of 1994, Linda's accounting firm hired a high school student named Kerry Davis to do secretarial work. Linda Jones quickly bonded with the 17-year-old. Kerry told Linda that her father had mental problems and that her mother was an alcoholic. Kerry talked to me one day, was very upset, and said that uh, she was having to leave where she was living and had no place to go. With her own children at college, Linda invited the teenager to live at the house until things got straightened out. Linda's daughter Jill says that from the start she had a bad feeling about Carrie Davis. I just get vibes from people and the aura that she put off didn't set well with me. I guess like she was out for something else, but I don't know what. <laughs> After a few months, Jill and her mother noticed that Jack and Carrie would often flirt. It soon became too much for Linda to bear. I called him at work and I said, look, you need to come home. I said, we need to talk about whatever this problem is. Jack broke down and admitted that he and Carrie were having an affair. Linda demanded that Carrie move out, and he agreed. But what Jack told Linda next would turn her world upside down. He professed his love for the young girl. For Jack to say, I love her and I want to be with her, I think this was more than Linda could handle. And it was a slap in the face after being with a man for over 25 years. Over the next few weeks, the Joneses' marriage unraveled. Jack set Carrie up in an apartment and began to see her every day, even while still living with his wife. She felt like her life was spinning out of control. I mean, she felt she was losing control of everything. She was um, depressed, experienced a lot of anxiety. Linda's day planner had entries about Jack and Carrie that revealed her growing anger. One read, he left me alone, had lunch with horror. One of the things that Linda told me, and, and maybe this was Linda's thoughts at the time, that she didn't want to be fat and 40 and alone. But Linda says she believed her husband would ultimately choose his family over his mistress. Carrie had a conversation with me, I would say about halfway through this. Why don't you let him go? Let him go? This is his home. If Jack wanted to leave, if he wanted to be with you, if he wanted to stay with you and set up house, he would do that. After the affair had been going on for over three months, Linda noted in her calendar that she had found a charge on her and Jack's credit card for a diamond engagement ring. The Jones daughters say it was painful to watch their mother in such a difficult position. She didn't raise us to be dependent on any man and as much as I love my dad, I, wouldn't, I didn't want her to be staying independent on him.
In October, just a few weeks before the murder, Detective Waugh was called to investigate a series of incidents involving Linda Jones. On two occasions, Linda reported break-ins at her home. She also claimed she was sexually assaulted outside a local bar. In each case, Linda told police she suspected Carrie Davis was somehow involved. But Detective Waugh believed otherwise. In talking with Jack and talking with Carrie, um, I, I didn't feel like Carrie was having this done. What, why would she have this done? She had Jack. It appeared more so that Linda was behind some of these things, if they were really occurring. To friends and family, it seemed that Linda was losing her grip. Some people get pushed over the edge, and I think that's what happened to Linda. She got pushed over the edge and started the wheel in motion and could not stop it. Detective Waugh suspected Linda Jones was involved in her husband's murder, but he still had no physical evidence linking her to the crime. The detective needed a break, and he would soon get it with a fingerprint match and a pair of confessions. December 1995, near Jacksonville, Florida. Detective Tom Waugh was investigating the murder of 48-year-old Jack Jones. The detective had suspicions about Jones' wife, Linda. Waugh had learned the couple had been having marital problems. In addition, cell phone records from the night of the murder linked Linda to a man named Donald Bradley, who police believed may have been at the scene of the crime. Still, the detective was far from proving that Linda was involved. There was a bloody kind of a footprint there, a piece of duct tape on the door. I had a gut feeling that somehow Linda was behind something. But until the right evidence comes or the confession comes, you know, I can have opinions all day long. On the advice of her lawyer, Linda refused to talk to police. She believed that authorities were unfairly singling her out as a suspect. The whole bottom line is it's not as if you're innocent or guilty. It's we want to we want to solve the case. We want to close the case. Doesn't matter. Linda and Jack's daughters stood by their mother and said they were certain she had nothing to do with their father's murder. She wouldn't hurt my dad. I don't believe she did it at all, because if I had any thought that she did, I wouldn't support her, because it was my dad, too. To help his investigation, Detective Waugh interviewed more than 100 people. One of them was Linda's lifelong friend, Janice Cole. When Waugh called her on December 5th, Cole says she was reluctant to talk, but agreed. I felt like I was betraying my dear friend. I felt like I had to say what I had to say because Jack was also my dear friend. Janice said she was troubled by a conversation she'd had with Linda just days before the murder. She had told me that she was backed up enough to a wall that she was so angry with him right then and there that she knew that she could take a gun, you know, and shoot him and get away with it. Janice told the detective everything she knew, including comments by Linda that Jack had a life insurance policy worth half a million dollars. She also told police that Linda didn't want Jack's teenage girlfriend, Carrie, to end up with it. It was one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do in my life, and I hope I never have to go there again. Detective Waugh found other people who corroborated Janice Cole's depiction of a woman who would do anything to end her husband's affair. Waugh's investigation would build momentum when he spoke to a client of Linda's accounting firm named Greg Green. Green a known drug addict said that Linda had paid him to stage a sexual assault and to break into her house to fake burglaries. Green also claimed that Linda offered him $15,000 to kill her husband. The money would come from Jack's life insurance policy. Others told police similar stories. Keith Falana and Ricky Byers also knew Linda through her accounting firm. They said she often talked about wanting her husband dead. I mean, one time she actually said, I'll, I'll pay somebody to kill him. <laughs> we looked at each other and kind of laughed, you know. In the days before the murder, Ricky Byers claimed Linda came to him and another friend, Dwight Danahoo, to make an offer. 
She acted funny that night, and that's when she was approaching Dwight and myself about the job war to make some money. And she says, I'll give you this as a down payment when y'all get the job done. I'll give you the rest of it. I just looked at her and I said, you are messed up bad. Despite these accounts, Detective Waugh still didn't have enough direct evidence to charge Linda Jones with murder. Waugh now turned his attention back to Donald Bradley, the man who called Linda the night of the crime. On January 22, 1996, the detective and his partner showed up unannounced at Bradley's home. At first, Bradley said he could not remember where he had been the night of November 7th. When pressed by investigators, Bradley said he had been out on his minivan that night to pick up tax forms at Linda's office. He also admitted to talking to her on the phone. I said, well, you know, kind of being facetious, I asked him, I said, well, that last phone call, Donald, to the house, um, was there any, what, what could you, you know, there was a murder going on. Did, did you hear anything? Was said Bradley appeared agitated, but admitted nothing. Police then impounded Bradley's 1995 Nissan minivan. But investigators didn't find any trace of blood or other evidence that could link Bradley to the crime. Although Bradley's statements and behavior were suspicious, Detective Waugh still didn't have enough to make an arrest. It wasn't until July 8, 1996, eight months after the murder of Jack Jones, that the case took a dramatic turn. Donald Bradley was arrested for attacking a man during a traffic dispute. In the car with Bradley was his employee, 21-year-old Brian McQuite. It was merely by hunch that I said, well, let me submit his prints. When he did, the detective finally found what he was looking for, a match to the fingerprint discovered at the crime scene. So that was great. That was, that was a turning point, obviously. On September 14th, police arrested Brian McQuite for the murder of Jack Jones. At first, McQuite denied being involved, but when his younger brother Patrick came forward and confessed his involvement in the murder, Brian changed his story. The two brothers explained how Donald Bradley had offered them $100 each to help rough up a man who was cheating on his wife. The McQuites told police how on the night of November 7th, Bradley picked them up in his minivan and made cell phone calls to a woman asking if her husband had returned home. They said they drove to the Jones house and walked in through an unlocked door. They claimed that Linda said nothing and allowed the men to bind her with duct tape. Then the McQuites claimed Bradley went wild. They said he beat Jack Jones with a wooden club he'd brought along and with a handgun he had found in the house. Jack was left unconscious and bloodied on the family room floor. As the three men walked out of the house, the McQuite said, Bradley cut Linda's duct tape. Brian and Patrick McQuite were charged with first degree murder. Facing the possibility of the death penalty, the brothers agreed to testify against Linda Jones and Donald Bradley. With two confessions, a matching fingerprint and circumstantial evidence, Prosecutor Tim Collins felt he had a case. We were confident at that point in time that we could go ahead and arrest Linda Jones and Donald Bradley for the murder of Jack Jones. On September 26, 1996, Linda Jones and Donald Bradley were indicted on charges of first degree murder. I was surprised about everybody, the whole thing. We were shackled, handcuffed, taken out the jail, the front steps, walked down the sidewalk, up the courtroom steps. It was all about show, drama, theater. They're not caring whose lives they hurt. Following the indictment, Linda Jones continued to insist that she had nothing to do with her husband's murder. Now, she would have the chance to tell her story to a jury in court. But so would others 
including Linda's lifelong friend, Janice Cole. The trial is next. October 1997, Green Cove Springs, Florida. Linda Jones and Donald Bradley were about to stand trial for the murder of Linda's husband, Jack Jones. Prosecutors announced they would be seeking the death penalty in both cases. Linda stood trial first. On October 29th at the Clay County Courthouse, friends and family of both Linda and Jack Jones filled the courtroom. The Jones daughters came in support of their mother's innocence. She basically worshiped the ground my dad walked on, I guess is a way to phrase it. And she wouldn't want to hurt him. In his opening statement, prosecutor Tim Collins told the jury that Linda Jones had a strong motive for killing her husband. Revenge for Jack's affair with a teenage girl and Linda's desire for money. Collins argued that Linda Jones masterminded every step of her husband's murder. And she was subject to inheriting because of his death half a million dollars. The first obstacle to overcome in almost every domestic homicide is showing the jury that this person who otherwise looks very normal and could be their next door neighbor could in fact commit such a heinous crime. In his opening, Defense attorney Mark Green said Linda had nothing to do with the murder. He claimed that Donald Bradley had come to the house without her knowledge to beat up her husband, then lost control and killed him. Green accused police of railroading his client. She's not the one who should be here. It's Donald Bradley you will learn that committed this murder. Our defense was that Linda Jones was an easy target of a sloppy investigation that they had a bunch of criminals who had a lot to gain by turning on her, as we say in the vernacular scumbags, who are turning state's evidence. I want to direct your attention to the summer of On October 29th, the state called its first witness, Linda's lifelong friend, Janice Cole. Testifying on that stand was one of the scariest things I ever had to do. To Janice told the jury about her conversation with Linda before the murder. She said she knew that she could take, just take a gun and kill Jack and just get away with it. And I said, well, Linda, I said, you don't want to do that. I said, you, you could get a divorce. You, there's life after divorce. It's much, much better out there. You, you know, you'll find somebody else. And she says, no, she said she knew she could just do it. I can't ever remember saying the things that she said, I said. But even if this conversation did take place, even if I did say that, she would have had to have known that this was just a conversation. This was clearly made in the heat of anger, this statement, and Janice Cole knew better, and we felt that uh, she was just trying to play up to the prosecution. The state then called witnesses who testified that Linda Jones had acted on her desire to kill Jack. Mr. Danahoe, could you please tell me your name? Mervyn Dwight Danahoe. Mike Danahoo, a client of Linda's, testified that Linda was looking for someone to murder not only Jack Jones, but also his girlfriend, Carrie Davis. She wanted uh, me to kill Carrie, and she came again, wanted me to beat up Jack, and she came a third time and wanted me to kill Jack. Another witness, Greg Green, testified that Linda offered to pay him $15,000 to kill her husband. The money, she told him, would come from Jack Jones' life insurance policy. The defense struck back, labeling both Dwight Danahu and Greg Green as drug addicts who were not to be trusted. We had learned that Greg Green had sold crack cocaine to an undercover officer, and we forced them to pursue that investigation and charge him with the crime. And in fact, he was in jail when he testified. Dwight Danahu was a uh, alcoholic for at least 20 or 30 years. And he couldn't remember from one day to the next whether or not he was telling the truth. On the third day of trial, the prosecution called its most important witnesses, Patrick and Brian McQuite. 
Brian's fingerprint was found on a piece of duct tape used to restrain Linda. The two brothers told the jury that Donald Bradley had paid them to beat up Jack Jones. They also said they had heard Bradley call someone three times the night of the murder. The McQuites described how Linda barely reacted to the beating of her husband. They also said that Bradley made sure to cut her duct tape before the men left. Their testimony was absolutely consistent with the evidence found at the scene. The piece of tape that had clearly been cut had been stuck to the back door as they had left. Well, we took the piece of tape off the back door and it matched up precisely to the tape that had been on her hands. On cross-examination, defense attorney Green challenged the brother's testimony by pointing out that the radio was on in the car and that they could not have heard exactly what Bradley said in his cell phone calls. Green also suggested that Linda may have been quiet the night of the murder because she was in shock. Finally, Green questioned the McWhite's motives for testifying at all. Mr. Collins had worked out a deal with them where they weren't gonna get sentenced until after the trial. What I kind of um, uh, explained to the jury was, you're buying somebody's testimony, therefore it's not credible or believable. The prosecution next introduced evidence that backed up the McQuite brothers' testimony. Donald Bradley's cell phone records from the night of the murder. They showed that Bradley made his last call to Linda Jones just minutes before her call to 911. Shortly before the homicide, you're talking to the person who your attorney ultimately admits in opening statement killed your husband. Those kind of things just don't make sense. The cell phone records show that a call was placed to a certain number. It doesn't mean that a conversation took place. It doesn't mean that he actually spoke to Linda Jones. The McQuite brothers had presented the jury with compelling testimony that matched the physical evidence and linked Linda Jones to the murder of her husband. The question now was, would Linda Jones take the stand in her own defense? Can someone with a prior criminal record be a credible witness at trial? You tell us at AETV.com. November 1997, Green Cove Springs, Florida. Linda Jones was on trial for the killing of her husband, Jack. A couple speckles of blood. A million dollars. If convicted, the 50-year-old mother of two could face the death penalty. Her daughters were in court every day to support her. On the fourth day of trial, defense attorney Mark Green began presenting his case. One of the first issues was determining whether or not Linda should testify. At one point, he was putting me on the stand. The next point, I know he's not putting me on the stand. In the end, Mark Green decided Linda should not testify in her own defense. In this case, there were so many things that could be turned against Linda Jones in so many areas the prosecution could go into that we felt we had enough evidence to work with without her testifying that we thought might create a reasonable doubt. Green argued against the state's theory that Linda Jones had masterminded the murder. He claimed that Donald Bradley, the other person charged in the crime, was responsible, and that the state's investigation was overzealous and sloppy. To prove his point, Green made the unorthodox move of calling to the stand Detective Tom Waugh. Green fired questions at Waugh about the way he conducted his investigation the night of the murder. It was incomprehensible to me. No less than 12 people trampled the crime scene. It was a very imprecise, unsophisticated investigation of good old country boys performing their good old country investigation and uh, saying there's a couple things that point her away. Let's just focus on her. I may have formed a little bit of an opinion, but it's based on facts. Everybody's a suspect, everybody, until they're proven otherwise. And I start right in the, in the middle, who's alive? Linda, who's dead, Jack. Linda's the next one there. To show that Linda was legitimately upset the night of the murder, Green ended his defense with her call to 911. I don't think he's breathing. You don't, okay. We have people on the way, okay? I gotta go. He doesn't wait to breathe. I gotta go. 
We thought that it would prove and be consistent with our theme that it was a real burglary by three masked men and who turned out to be Donald Bradley. On November 4th, 1997, both sides delivered their closing arguments. Linda Jones was a desperate individual and let her greed and vengeance um, rule her life on those few weeks there in October, November. It was a shoddy, horrible, unscientific investigation that led them to the ines inescapable conclusion that it was Linda Jones. There are too many unanswered questions. After five days of testimony, the case went to the jury. I honestly believed that we would win this case. It never occurred to me that I would be convicted on hearsay. After 15 hours of deliberation, the jury returned with a verdict. Linda Jones was found guilty of the first degree murder of her husband, Jack. All I can remember is I laid my head up against Mark and it was an immediate thing to get me out, to get me out. Linda's daughter, Shane, lashed out at Detective Tom Waugh for targeting her mother. Now, I have no mother. She has no mother. We do not have any type of family. I think he wanted her and didn't care about the truth of the case and what happened. He just wanted her for whatever reason. Linda's sentencing hearing took place later that day. For the first time, the jury heard from Linda herself. I did not kill my husband. I had nothing to do with his death. I don't know what happened to him. I did not want him dead. I did not want him hurt. Prosecutor Tim Collins argued for the harshest penalty under the law, death for Linda Jones. Justice will not be served. If you go back there and you recommend life simply because Linda Jones is a woman. After deliberating for over an hour, the jury decided not to impose the death penalty. Linda Jones was sentenced to life in prison without parole. I feel so sorry for Linda right now. I really do. But I also in my heart of hearts, feel so sorry for Jack. He was a good man, and he's in the ground. He will never see his grandchildren. I mean, when you take a life, you have to pay. But Linda Jones still insists that she is innocent. There's people that feel I deserve to be here, that I had a part in it. Well, I can't ever change that. I can't ever change their opinion. They will always want to have somebody to blame. My daughters and my family and my friends, they know. Linda's daughters continue to stand by her, but they still grieve for the father they lost. My dad wasn't there, or my mom, for my college graduation. And they weren't there for either one of our weddings. It shouldn't have happened. God is good, and he'll bring her home. She doesn't deserve to be there. But when she comes home, my dad won't come home with her. Donald Bradley, the man accused of beating Jack Jones to death, was found guilty of first-degree murder. He was given the death penalty. His case is under appeal. Brothers Patrick and Brian McQuite pleaded guilty to third-degree felony murder and were sentenced to 10 years in prison. They have since been released. Linda Jones, meanwhile, has a new lawyer and is filing a motion to reopen the case. If nothing changes, Linda Jones will spend the rest of her life behind bars. For American Justice, I'm Bill Curtis.